want to make a test of the fundamental theories of the universe, you want to go to the most extreme laboratories in the universe. And a black hole is that. A black hole is the most mysterious object in the universe. It's when matter gets to be in such a small space, and it's so dense that the force of gravity prevents even light from escaping. Now, that's a one-way door from our universe. My friends, welcome to another special episode of the Into the Impossible podcast featuring a renowned scientist, Dr. Shep Dolman of Harvard University, the founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope that released some of the most iconic images ever captured in science history and I claim maybe in human history because it really took the global village of intellects, of minds, of money, collaboration around the world and today Shep and I geeked out about what are these images based upon? What's the technology that goes into them? And more than just the, the human drama that we do discuss, what is the technology, technological drama? What would Einstein say uh, seeing such things? And so we went off on a very deep dive into the technology, which I know that you, my audience, the most astute, astoundingly intellectual minds in the multiverse will appreciate more than almost any other person on earth. Uh, so please do share it also with your friends and family who may be interested as well. And we also did talk about some of the controversy, some of the surprising things, things ranging from uh, how do you lead a collaboration? How do you avoid toxicity? How do you handle things like sexism and, uh, and some uh, repugnant behavior that took place around the world when these uh, first images shocked and shook up the universe? Where do we go from here in technological space, but also how do we convey to the next generation of scientists? how best to really work together, cooperate, and learn using these teachable moments, uh, such as those that we elucidate in this talk. It was really a phenomenal conversation, so much fun. I think it's his first podcast uh, that he's ever done. And we went deep, we went broad, and we culminated with the thrilling three final questions that you'll have to subscribe uh, to the podcast to view. So you can do that on YouTube, but I also ask you to do so on my website, briankeating.com. Uh, but I do uh, request that you sign up and then you'll get access to the thrilling three questions. And you won't want to miss it because Shep was incredibly vulnerable uh, and, uh, and, and just open, authentic, and honest. So I think you'll enjoy this episode of the Into the Impossible podcast with Dr. Shep Dolman, PI of the Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Something upbeat to begin one of my beginning interviews of 2022 with a uh, phenomenal scientist, uh, a pioneer in the field of imaging black holes and uh, doing so from literally the entire surface of the earth from the south pole to the chilean atacama desert to uh everywhere else in between and that's uh, dr shep dolman of harvard uh, smithsonian center for astrophysics joining us all the way from beautiful downtown cambridge is dr dolman and how are you today sir i'm well thank you very much brian good to be here you are the founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT. You are the principal investigator of the NG EHT, the next generation EHT. And you're a senior research fellow at Harvard University. And I thought that we'd start, you know, normally, Shep, I have on authors and I ask them, like, how'd you come up with this stupid title and name for your stupid new book? Like this one over here. I had this author on. This author is always on. Uh, you know, where, where'd you come up with this dumb idea, this dumb cover title? Um, that's my book. <laughs> but but you don't have a book yet, although I'm curious if there's something in the works, maybe like your colleague, Heino Falco, who was on the show earlier in 2021. <clears throat> but... Um, okay. Since you don't have a book, I want to start off with what you do, and I want to ask you the question that I ask uh, my colleagues that study black holes, and it is, what fascinates you the most about black holes? Well, black holes play in a lot of different arenas. Mathematicians love them, physicists love them, even philosophers get all you know dewy-eyed about black holes and, uh, and sort of astronomers. The thing that fascinates me most about them is that it seems as though they are the most efficient engines for changing the universe. So when you look at the night sky, it looks the way it does because black holes exist. And we know so little about them. So 
my whole career has been trying to figure out what are they, how can we make images of them, and how do we learn more about them. And where did the idea of the Event Horizon Telescope come from? You know, I get that question a lot. And it's one of those interesting projects where it has a lot of different tributaries all coming together. So you've got you know, Einstein thinking about black holes, Schwarzschild solving this equation in the trenches of World War I, mm. uh, coming up with this idea of a Schwarzschild radius, the point at which nothing can escape from a gravitationally bound, very compact object. And then this realization from the observational point that there are probably black holes in the centers of most galaxies, which came from radio astronomy in the 60s. And then in, in the 70s, something very interesting happened. People began to simulate what a black hole might look like if it were at the center of a galaxy or being fed by a star. And there were some really interesting simulations by uh, a French astronomer named Jean-Pierre Luminet, and he was credited with the first simulation that showed what a black hole might look like, with all the twisty lensing that happens right near the event horizon. And uh, at the same time, people were using radio interferometry, my game, and looking at very high angular resolution images. And they were realizing that there are very compact objects in the center of galaxies. Those were probably black holes. So now we had this theory of what they might look like. We had this idea that they existed. And <clears throat> probably around in, in the mid 90s, we began to really focus on Sagittarius A star the center of our Milky Way galaxy, where we think there's a 4 million solar mass black hole. And, and then there was some uh, uh, Heino's work, for example, uh, that showed uh, what the shadow of the black hole might look like, an extension of Jean-Pierre's work. And then we began to realize through this idea of massive digital signal processing, I mean, harnessing Moore's law to make a new kind of telescope, that this was really possible. And we wrote a paper for the uh, Decadal Review in the, um, you know, for the U.S. Decadal Review, every 10 years, all the astronomers come together and they say, what's new? What are we going to do next? And we wrote a paper there and said, this is the decade. We will image a black hole by the end of this decade. And we made it with three months to spare. So the, the, the origin story is that theory, observation, all came together around the mid-90s and the 2000s it became possible. I believe we were all sitting around a table at the American Astronomical Society meeting in uh, like 2009 and said, Event Horizon Telescope, catchy. And then we were off and running. Yeah, it's, you know, funny that people point out <clears throat> that technology has, you know, been around for several decades, uh, you know, in one form or another since Jansky in the 1930s at Bell Labs. Uh, but the application and the confluence of it with digital, you know, computer processing, correlators, et cetera, um, make it really come to fruition at this specific moment in time and perhaps no earlier. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the technology. My audience is the most astute technological collection of 56,000 people now and growing uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you'll ever find. So don't be afraid to geek out a little bit. How do these, in how do these instruments work together as a telescope because it's not called the event horizon telescopes it's called the telescope meaning it's a singular right. telescope what sense is it right. a singular telescope well so there's, a, there's a few different things that come together to make this all possible um and, and it's really a question of why now right because this was the moment when you could really pull this off so in the late in the mid 90s people had made radio interferometric detections of a black hole, right? They peered into the center of our Milky Way galaxy and they'd seen something there, but we, we didn't have the sensitivity to make an image. And so what we really needed was an explosion in bandwidth. We needed to be able to record a hundred times more data than we had been recording before to make these images. And, and so we, we did this by a concerted effort to harness Moore's law and we reimagined all of the instrumentation that had been used in the past, brought it into the digital age, and that is what made this possible. Now, what do you do with those recorders? So the way that very long baseline interferometry works, this is the technique that we use to turn the Earth into a telescope, is we point 
All of our telescopes in the array, every telescope on the Earth is swivels to look at the black hole at exactly the same time. We synchronize them all with GPS. They all know exactly what time it is. At each station, we have atomic clocks. So the ticking is so precise that when waves come from the black hole, they can be synchronized perfectly into a plane. And we can then start to really process these data. We record at each of these sites on high bandwidth recorders, like 64 gigabits per second, all the data coming from the black hole. And then we, we close up shop, then we're done. Except that we're not done, we've just begun, right? So <laughs> then all of that data is sent back uh, on hard disk drives to a central supercomputer where they're played back and all of the data are played back in just the right way so that we act as though we've had a parabolic dish the size of the earth. So mm -hmm. all the plane waves coming from the black hole hit this virtual par parabola. All the delays are encoded in digital electronics. And we wind up comparing the data that we record in Chile with the data we record in Spain, with the data we record you know, in, in Hawaii. And we create a telescope as large as the surface of the Earth in much the same way that an optical dish bounces light off of its surface and comes to a focus. And that's where you put your camera. We do the same thing, but in digital electronics. And the technology synthesizes this enormous telescope. Um, and I wonder, you know, uh, we're kind of presaging some of the audience questions that we're going to get to. But one of them is, you know, relatively astute. And, and it's kind of uh, focuses, no pun intended, uh, on this aspect of, you know, baseline, which is the maximum separation versus the aperture of each individual dish. And they're wondering, this uh, viewer is wondering, you know, what if you just had one tiny little, you know, put a dish TV size dish, but you put it at L2 where the Webb telescope is, you know, so careful so they don't bump into each other. Uh, it's getting mm -hmm. crowded out there with Planck, WMAP, and, uh, and now the Webb telescope. But uh, tell me, would you benefit more from one more telescope like that? Or would you benefit more from a South Pole sized telescope or an Alma sized telescope at the North Pole? Uh, you know, where would you start to benefit more? Is it the bigger is better or is it that farther is better? So there's a lot to learn about black holes. And as you can imagine, the kind of telescope you employ gives you a better look at some science, and then if a different kind of telescope would give you a good look at other scientific areas of inquiry. So if you were to put a telescope at L2, that's a great question, by the way, fabulous question. I told you my you audience have, is the best and brightest in the multiverse. This, this is an astute crowd. So you would wind up getting an angular resolution that was a fraction of a micro arc second. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the, like, the equivalent of seeing like a, a human hair on the moon. I mean, this is really kind of tiny stuff or maybe a BB on the moon. I forget exactly what the analogy would be, yeah. but it, it's about, it would be you know, many times finer angular resolution than even the event horizon telescope can do. And the problem with that is that you would need to have a pretty big telescope out there to get the sensitivity that you needed to look at the very fine structures, because then you're only sensitive to the tiniest structures on the sky. Now, thankfully, we now know that the ring of light around the black hole, the shadow, consists of multiple concentric rings, each more fine than the previous one. So what you could do by going out to L2 is start to look at the very fine, almost fractal structure mm of this ring, which is formed by multiple orbits of light around the black hole. Mm. Just, just that, that blows my mind, actually, <laughs> that, that, that light is trapped to travel in circles around a black hole, and we might see that with such a telescope at L2. Now, if you put a telescope at the North Pole, or you added telescopes on the ground, then you'd probably be able to make a much richer image of the black holes that we already can see, like Sagittarius A star, M87. And that would show us the flow of material around the black hole. And we'd learn a lot about accretion. So L2, we learn about GR, general relativity, makes Einstein happy. And if you had more uh, sites on the Earth, we'd learn a lot more about accretion. So we'd make a lot of astrophysicists happy because then they'd learn why black holes shine. Right. So it's kind of you'd win in all cases. And maybe it'd be controversial if you were a director of NASA for the 2020 decadal uh, survey. I mean, w would you prioritize? I mean, the James Webb telescope cost 
10 billion dollars which is equivalent to the lhc and they launched it into space and it's going to do wonderful things i'm sure uh but that kind of swallowed up a huge portion of astrophysics general uh budget for the future and doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, the budget of the lh of the eht which i think is much much smaller and um and and i wonder you know if if you can you know comment on that and in other words where do you when do you decide you know uh that the scientific reach of an instrument justifies maybe even you know superseding a new way of looking at the universe let's call web new even though it's you know they have share some things mm-hmm. with certif and, and other previous existing experiments but anyway how would you as a policymaker prioritize doing uh, upgrades to eht if you weren't you know that had a vested interest in it <laughs> yeah well so l- let me put it this way i told you before that in 2010 we submitted a paper to the 2010 decadal review and we said, this is what we'd like to do. We think we can image a black hole by the end of the decade. I didn't tell you the end of that story. Mm. The end of that story is that we didn't make it into the decadal review. Right. The Event Horizon Telescope did not appear in the decadal report. Hmm. They did not think it was worthy. Wow. But then here we are in 2019 coming with the first image of a black hole. So the decadal review and the consensus of all the astronomers uh, of repute uh, taken together is not always in my view, the right one, because right. they overlook the long shots, they overlook the innovation, they overlook the high risk, high payoff. They want to know what the entire community can get behind with a 100% chance of success in the long run. And the EHT was risky. You know, we needed uh, champions, we needed happy warriors, we needed people who were going to risk careers in order to make that happen. And and that's not what the Decatur Review is about. Now, now that we know that black hole shadows exist. Now I would prioritize it much more mm-hmm. prominently in that report. And, and we did get fairly good mention in the Astro 2020 report. Yeah. But, but again, if I was the NASA head, I would say full steam ahead. Uh, let's, let's put something in space to create a virtual telescope larger than our planet. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get to NGEHT later, <clears throat> but I do want to ask, you know, you, you're very cautious and circumspect, and I respect that and appreciate that. You're talking a lot about the the light shadow and these concentric rings. Um, you're less referring to it as the event horizon, imaging the event horizon. Talk about, is that just a, a distinction without a difference, Shep? Or is it, you know, just you sometimes will call these two equivalent things the same? Well, so this is a really interesting point. I mean, if you talk to a physicist about what an event horizon is, they'll have a slightly different view than an astronomer, right? So an astronomer is looking for some kind of phenomenological um, membrane. You know, so where do you not see any light? Uh, where do you get this infinite redshift? And, and and where can you see light bending around? And a physicist will think about it in terms of the information paradox and, um, and conformal field theory. So your definition of the event horizon, and more importantly, your definition of when you've seen it, will change depending upon your perspective. So for, from, from our perspective as astronomers, we see this ring of light, and we realize that this is the manifestation of all of the simulations we've ever run. So our best physics, our best understanding of GR, all show this feature when there is an event horizon. So we're happy, we're comfortable in that space. We're we're comfortable saying, we've seen something that we think is the smoking gun for an event horizon. Now, other people will say, well, have you really seen an actual event horizon? Have you seen matter disappear from our our consciousness, our, our, our sensory apparatus forever? We haven't done that. Um, and, and even more to the point, people look at this ring and they say, well, have you really seen the, the photon orbit? Right, which is a slightly different thing than seeing a ring of emission around a right. black hole. And, and, and there we think that new instruments will corroborate our finding that this is the event horizon of a black hole. Uh, next generation, as you said, is going to be a new instrument that will do that. But uh, you'd have to do some pretty interesting gymnastics mm-hmm. to get it out from the fact that this marks an event horizon. But, but mm-hmm. there are, I'm perfectly willing to admit there are non- GR space times. Uh, there are potentially non black hole solutions, but they tend to be extremely exotic, Brian. Right. 
And for reference, we're talking about the, the portrait that is framed above your right shoulder in the background of your office, living room, wherever you may happen there to be. You go above. Uh, many people, yeah. some of my uh, listeners have as their avatar that picture uh, on Facebook for Facebook groups. It's, it's really an iconic image. And it was one of the few you know, really positive things to come out during the pandemic time, uh, kind of united the world in, uh, in an awful lot of celebratory, non-political, non-biological pandemic related <laughs> news that showed what the human species is capable of. One of my colleagues, the late great Hans Parr, who is a professor here, was a student of Leon Letterman at Columbia, he used to say that GR was the culmination of all of Western civilization. And I said, well, what do you mean, uh, Hans? You know, what, what does that mean? He said, well, you know, think about what it takes to get GR to work. You needed to have language, mathematics. You needed to have, you know, conversations, culture, robust consensus. You needed to have arguments and have detractors and, and so forth. Then you need to publicize it, disseminate it, get funding for it, political. It spans every dimension of, of you know, of human interaction. So it's, it's rightfully seen as a, as a, uh, uh, appropriation of our culture. And in fact, Einstein himself said, um, you know, when he was asked, you know, is he, you know, how does he view himself compared to other scientists? He said that he paled and this is, you know, a little sock puppet I have of him. Um, and he, he said, I pale in comparison to Isaac Newton who did even more for civilization than I did. Now, this was a human project more than almost anything else. And before we get to the human, you know, interest aspects of it, I do want to talk about the challenges, the technological, and the one that I'm most familiar with, although, you know, I have, um, you know, participated in, in robust discussion about EHT, but um, the South Pole Telescope. So just today, you, I, I noticed you, d you do have a Twitter uh, account, which is kind of cool to see. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in your um, in the graphics. So I'm my pr super producer, Stuart, do that. But, uh, but I want to ask, that telescope today just tweeted out that they are installing a new tertiary mirror. Uh, talk about the importance of the South Pole. It has a huge kind of um, soft spot in my heart. I do love this. I don't like the South Pole as much as I like uh, Antarctica, McMurdo, et cetera, which is much more pleasant to visit. But um, but I've spent some time at the South Pole, and you have too, right? And uh, talk about what it, the importance of that particular instrument is. I mean, as George Orwell said, all telescope baselines are important, but some are more equal than others, right? So talk about the South Pole Telescope. Why did they upgrade the tertiary? My friend John Carlstrom, uh, who's a titanic figure um, you know, in, in all of astrophysics, he's made so many discoveries. Why did he dedicate this cosmology telescope studying what I think is the most important thing, the CMB over my shoulder. Why, why is the South Pole Telescope so important to this mission of EHT? Well, so first of all, I, the South Pole Telescope is important, but it's, it's, it's really a case where all the telescopes are important because in, in very long baseline interferometry, it's location, location, location. It's just like real estate. <laughs> and, and, and having many telescopes all around the globe are, is quite important. Now, the South Pole Telescope has a few attributes that make it quite attractive. So first of all, it's the best observing location just about on the surface of the planet for what we do. I mean, at, at a wavelength of one millimeter, wavelength of 0.87 millimeters, you routinely get unparalleled long periods of excellent uh, viewing and excellent weather. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that for one of our sources, the, gal the galactic center of the Milky Way, um, where there's a 4 million solar mass black hole, uh, it's at 30 degrees, minus 30 degrees declination, so it just circles in the sky. So you always are able to see that source. So no matter what other telescope can see Sagittarius A star on the rest of the globe, it always has a partner mm -hmm. with the South Pole. So the South Pole is everyone's friend from that mm -hmm. perspective. And, and it gives you very long north-south baselines. So as you, as you can imagine, civilization kind of exists in this band around the, uh, the, the Earth. And uh, we really prize the north-south sites, which can stretch our resolution, which can give us spatial understanding of what's on the sky in different dimensions. So we really like the fact that we have a telescope now in Greenland and now also one in, in the South Pole. And... And what I think is interesting, you mentioned John Carlstrom and the CMB, the, the fact that the South Pole has agreed to work with us as part of the Event Horizon Telescope just shows that you can have one cutting edge application for a telescope in this great location. And then you can timeshare, you can deliver even more science by just a few changes, this tertiary mirror, 
a new receiver that can give you a whole new dimension of science from that same location. So it's, uh, I love this idea of reusing what we already have. I'm a very thrifty kind of person <laughs> at heart, and I just love reusing things that we have to do new things. All right. Yes. Parsimony is the uh, friend of all astronomers. So the new tertiary and the new secondary, I forgot, I'm just looking up uh, Aman Chukchi's tweet. He's down at the South Pole. I think he's their winner over uh, mm-hmm. for the upcoming uh, Austral winter. I uh, tweeted out the uh, the new uh, picture of those two. I'll put those in the show notes or in the um, in the B-roll footage. Um, so why, why did it need a new one? I mean, what, what couldn't it do with the existing secondary and tertiary? Were those just not optimized for this? Uh, you know, to to provide the the highest resolution images, or is it necessary to do what we're going to get to in a minute to look deeper at Saturday Star, for example? So I'm, I'm not an expert on the South Pole Telescope. I'm, I'm the wrong person to give you the the lowdown and mm-hmm. the inner scoop on that. Uh, the secondary, I imagine, is being redone because they just want better acuity and better optics and better throughput for their telescope. They want to always put new instruments down mm-hmm. there for the cosmic microwave background. The, the tertiary mirror, I, I think, is interesting for the EHT because it may lead to a mode where we can quickly switch between what the South Pole normally does and the EHT mm-hmm. uh, because the, the South Pole normally uses a bolometer array, which is not suitable for the work that we do with the Event Horizon Telescope, and we need to switch to a different kind of receiver. And it used to be that you'd have to go out in the you know, austral winter in your know, minus 50 degrees to bolt a new mirror onto the South Pole telescope in order to do the EHT work. And I think this is going to lead to a much, um, much easier process for switching from one to the other. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So let's turn to the uh, to the next topic, which is uh, the difference between the different kinds of black holes that you can image. They're all super massive, right? You're, you're not imaging, you know, the same types of black holes that say LIGO uh, has has detected, mm-hmm. um, and yet they're very complementary. Obviously, they're very important. Uh, first of all, you know, there is a misconception that our galaxy, you know, is somehow orbiting around our Sag A star that it's responsible for. Our, is that is that correct? that our gal- the, the supermassive black hole at the center of Milky Way called Sag A star uh, is, the, uh, is the central mass that keeps our galaxy in orbit. Oh, yeah. So e- even though it is at pretty much the dynamical center of our galaxy, it's because it's settled there. Uh, the mass of the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way galaxy is a tiny fraction of the entire mass of the whole galaxy. I mean, our whole galaxy might have 10 to the 11 stars or something like that. And Sag A star is maybe a uh, four million stars, so it's a very, very small fraction of the total mass of our galaxy. Right, um, and indeed, it's also black holes make up, unfortunately, a, a minuscule amount of the uh, dark matter, or you know, un- invisible matter, as I understand it. Um, and yet, there is hope. Uh, both for you know detecting the similar kinds of patterns and so forth um, that you detected in M87 and the iconic image behind you, but also for Sag A star. So um, can you talk about, you know, presuming that is going to come out someday, and chronologically speaking, it will have to be after M87 was detected, if it ever does come out. Can you talk about what made the choice of, uh, was there a choice to prioritize one versus the other? Um, some, you know, the closer one versus a more massive one. Um, how did that um, if optimization program work on a technical level? As I'm, as I'm y- y- continuing to, to, you know, to hammer home, the audience is really keen to hear about what scientists are actually thinking to make these breakthroughs, not just the pretty pictures that result from them. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Brian. So for a long time, Sagittarius A star was thought to be our primary target. Because mm-hmm. There was incontrovertible evidence that there was something there. And of course, last year, uh, Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Ghez won the Nobel Prize for their work, nailing down uh, the fact that there was a very, very massive object in the center of our galaxy, almost certainly a black hole. So we knew what its mass was, we knew its location, it became the fixation for astronomers across many, many different wave bands, uh, yours truly included, as well as a lot of my colleagues. But then Around 2010, I mean, 2010, 2009, we realized that there might be some other opportunities mm. for imaging this light bending around an event horizon that causes the shadow. And in fact, if you go back to Jean-Pierre Luminet's 1979 paper, 
Mm -hmm. He has a wonderful sentence in there. And, and he says, this may be the kind of thing you would see at the heart of M87. So even in 1979, he, I think he was the first person to say, maybe this will happen for, for M87. So in 2009, we made observations of M87 and we mm -hmm. detected it. Mm -hmm. And then we published in, in 2012 uh, the evidence that there was something really compact there, equally as compact in terms of the Schwarzschild radius scale as what we had seen in the center of our own galaxy. Now we had two sources to look at. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it's huge. I mean, you're doubling your your target base, right? And and then uh, something very interesting comes into play then, because M87 is about a thousand times more massive than Sagittarius A star, and the dynamical time scale, let's geek out for a minute, Brian, that the orbital period around a black hole is directly proportional to its mass. So for Sagittarius A star, things move around the black hole in half an hour. So imagine that. You're looking at this black hole during an evening, and you want to add all your data together as the Earth rotates. And you can't do it because what you're trying to look at changes its appearance from moment to moment. It's like taking a picture of a runner sprinting by, taking the lens cap off your, your camera, you get a blur. Right. Um, so to do that, you have to make a movie of what you're seeing. So it requires a lot more data, a lot more finesse, a lot more algorithmic work, frankly. Mm -hmm. But for M87, it's so massive that it doesn't change for a whole week. For a whole right. week, it might stay roughly the same shape and, mm -hmm. and morphology. It's like the Buddha. It's like sitting there, just not moving, just... <laughs> Very, Eating. very yeah, still. Yeah, it looks like the Buddha. It's like Homer Simpson. I, I say it looks like a donut. Homer Simpson's taking well, a bite out of it. Well, M87 has given rise to a lot of memes. Uh, let's put it that way. But but it, it's just sitting there, and while the Earth rotates, it waits for its picture to be taken. So all the data from a night of observing can be added together, and you get a lot of data to make a great image. So that's why we went and came with the M87 image first, because it was easier. Because when we put together all the data for M87, it was so clear that we had a ironclad result, hmm. you know, a result that was really clear and true. Uh, for M87, we started analyzing the data at the same time, but it rapidly became apparent to us that it was more complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're continuing to work with those data now. I'm fairly certain that soon we will have some results on Sagittarius A star, but it's taken a long time because we had to develop a lot of the analysis techniques to deal with the fact that it was changing. Yeah. And that brings up uh, another you know, technical question, but uh, the, the advances in numerical relativity and, um, and prediction, I remember seeing some of those plots from the seventies, you know, it's like hand drawn in pencil or you know, it was on a, on a dot mm -hmm. matrix printer. And they're really quite beautiful and, and they look exactly like, you know, the, some of the reprocessed images that I've seen. Um, to what extent is the image behind you? You know, I often hear this, um, cause I've gotten into, uh, the, the person that re we've known, you and I have known each other for a little bit, but, uh, it took our friend, mutual friend Avi Loeb, uh, who's somewhere nearby, uh, your office there at CFA or in, at Harvard. And he reintroduced us together. And, uh, and then that led to this interview. So we have Avi Loeb, to, you know, he's a great matchmaker. Uh, so, um, when Avi was on last summer, a couple times on the Into the Impossible podcast, we talked a lot about aliens and, and detection and so forth of UAP phenomena, of course, Oumuamua, which, um, now that I'm a external advisor, on the Galileo project, I have received my own uh, sample of Oumuamua. So Avi gave me a piece of Oumuamua. No, I'm just kidding. This is just a meteorite, okay? Uh, but um, but these objects, you know, coursing across the sky, and then that brought up in the public's mind, especially when the Pentagon released these data uh, over the summer and and this kind of bland position report about it. Uh, it could be it's worth studying. Um, people start saying, "We want the data. We want." data from these astronomers and and my point is fine but you have to treat it the way that we treat our data uh, in other words you have to say all the things that go into the image that could be artifacts that could be uh, biases that could be you know re relics and remnants of unwanted signals and i pointed like the hubble deep field i like to be provocative i say the hubble deep field is not data 
image. It's an image. And, and yes, there's some data. You can count how many galaxies there are. You can make an estimate how many galaxies there are in the universe. You can see how many of them are red, how many are elliptical. You could do some analysis, but it's not the same as the raw data, right? So that's the raw data. Now, what is an amateur going to do with that or a non-expert amateur? I mean, amateurs do a lot in astronomy, as you know, but, but someone who you know, knows nothing about data processing, very little. So the question after that rambling preamble is, you know, the image behind you, to what extent is that data? Or is it merely, and there's nothing wrong with it, is it merely sort of a pretty picture? In other words, do you analyze that or do you actually have to go deeper? And if so, how do you go deeper to extract GR and numerical comparisons to numerical GR? Yeah, it's a really good question. First, I want to tackle the, the data question because we're only as good as our data. Mm-hmm. And we have to create a, an ironclad chain of custody, if you will, mm-hmm. all the way from the telescope you know, with these hard disk drives to the core later, to the astronomers doing the analysis, and then to the image. And we have to explain every step very, very carefully. The first thing I'll say is that we had duplication every step of the way. We never had one person, we never had one group, we never had one software um, package that was responsible for something that we didn't understand or couldn't compare to something else. So Mm -hmm. just think about the data pipelines. We had three different independent pipelines handling the data, and they all had to give the same result. Right. We had two separate correlators, one in Germany and one in, at MIT, processing the raw data into this interferometric data set that we imaged. And then we had three different imaging softwares. We had a, a very historical, traditional one called Clean, which was developed in the 70s that astronomers yeah. No one love. We get all, right. <laughs> you know, warm and runny when we think about clean. Um, but then we had developed two new lines of imaging software that were tailor made for the EHT. We intercompared them all, and and then we also looked at different simulations. We didn't trust one simulation of what we were supposed to be seeing. We used many different simulation packages, and we cross referenced all of them. So every step of the way, we had what I like to call a creative tension. It was creative because we were doing something new and we were comparing with each other, but also it was verification. You had to show that what you were getting was consistent with what somebody else was getting across the whole project. Mm-hmm. And so, so your listeners should be very um, confident that we treated the data and its analysis uh, very carefully every step of the way. Mm-hmm. Now, th- then there's, there's this question that you raised, which is, what is this? above my right shoulder. Like, what, you know, what, what is that? So we, we approached this in a couple of different ways. We modeled it. So we said, what is the best fit model to this? And the models that we used were you know, different kinds of rings, or we used doubles. We used many different kinds of modeling techniques. And I can assure you that of all of them, the, the shadow model, the, this like concentric uh, crescent, is by far and away the most probable. Okay, mm-hmm. So in, in models, you always look for the most probable. And then we used imaging techniques, like three, as I described to you, and all of them gave this particular image, hmm. and which is in some sense a best fit image. I mean, there are some images that also fit, but this is the general form of all of the images that fit well. And, and the last point is that we didn't trust ourselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's human drama that comes into any kind of endeavor like this, right? right. So we, we divided ourselves into four separate teams, all of whom had the data, but we couldn't talk to each other. And every group had to analyze the data completely independently, so there was no bias. So there wasn't group think. Everyone got in the room and said, we're all seeing a shadow. Of course we're seeing a shadow. Why wouldn't we see a shadow? Of course, yes. Mm-hmm. Each group found the shadow independently. And then we also tried to make it go away. Mm-hmm. So we, we tried to fit it with doubles. We tried to fill it with we tried to fit it with a fitted with a filled disc without the shadow dimple inside of it. We did everything we could, and the data always steered us back to this image. And it was really the fit to the data, as you said, Brian, that is the ultimate coin of the realm. And yes. and that is what we used to uh, convince ourselves that this shadow was real. And I think that, you know, follows perfectly, you know, Feynman's dictum, uh, which is, you know, the, the first principle is that you should not fool yourself 
The second principle is you're the easiest person to fool. And I always add the third principle is uh, you must not fool Richard Feynman because that's just cruel. Uh, But doing this and doing these blind analyses and doing these multiple analyses is kind of an example of what the military calls a red team approach where you've got Mm -hmm. adversaries who hopefully, you know, are loving each other, share the same mission, you know, they want to defeat the enemy or protect the country. Uh, and so, but they have radically different approaches. Some think we should have a Navy only. Some say we should have only an Air Force, you know, whatever. So, but taking this approach, adversaries that that combat with love, uh, you know, I think that's incredibly important. Before we get into uh, the, the softer science aspects, as you talked about in the collaboration, the uh, social science aspects, I do just want to close out some of the technical uh, commentary. Uh, and that is, you mentioned several times a correlator. Um, now I've used correlators in radio astronomical applications, um, you know, my whole career, such as it is. Uh, but, um, uh, but these correlators are very different uh, in that, as I understand, they're effectively like a super a homebrew supercomputer in some sense. So can you talk about what is the, co- what is a correlator? And you mentioned you have two of them. Why, why, why is it necessary to have two of them, but not two South Pole telescopes or two Alma dish? <laughs> uh, although yes, of course you have multiple telescopes, but why is the correlator itself so necess- uh, so, you know, important and crucial that you actually need two of them? Right, right. It's good. It's a good point. So I want to back up a little bit. This, this technique, the, we use to make this event horizon telescope. It, 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 there's a little magic to it, but essentially what we're doing is we're taking data from a network of radio dishes across the globe, all of whom are looking at the black hole at the same time. Now, we if, if we had an optical dish looking at the black hole, light from the black hole would hit all the different points on this dish, and the shape of the dish would focus it all to one point, and that's where you would put your camera. We talked about this a little bit before. With with VLBI, we have telescopes all over the world. We record the data as it comes in, time tag it with atomic clocks at each location so we know exactly when each trough and crest of these waves are recorded on the hard disks. Then we have to compare them. We We have to bring them all back to a virtual focus. So we have to take the data we recorded in Chile and combine it with the data we recorded in Spain for example, in the same way that the optical dish bounces the light so that it arrives at exactly the same moment at the focus. So what the correlator does is it plays back these recordings and delays or advances them perfectly in time to account for the shape of the Earth and relativity and things like this. So they come together at this virtual focus and they basically just uh, multiply and add the data together. Okay, so they they combine it just the way the light be combined at focus of one of these optical dishes. And then every baseline pair, every pair of telescopes gives you one essential, essentially one pixel of of the image that you're trying to to develop. So the the correlator does play a a critical role. It combines all the data after the fact from across the Event Horizon Telescope Array, and it winds up giving us baseline pair data that we then use to make the image behind it. Mm. Now, why do we need two of them? The reason we have two of them is because two exist, but it allows us to send half the data to one and half the data to the other, and then we cross-fertilize. We send a little bit of the same data between each of the correlators to make sure they're giving the exact same results Mm. and one more test that we ran. And then we combine the data from the two correlators to make this image. Excellent. So now let's turn uh, a little bit more towards the uh, theoretical aspects of black holes, which bewitch and bemuse you know, millions around the globe. And you know, two things are most prominent uh, that I talk about on this channel, at least with guests ranging from Sir Roger Penrose uh, to Reinhard Genzel and to uh, theorists from Frank Wilczek to uh to uh people like martin reese and that is uh two different notions one black hole singularities and the question of quantum gravity and the other one is the black hole information paradox which i talked a lot about with lenny suskin so let's first talk about this now you're an experimentalist you're not creating new theories and you're doing observations you're not responsible for for also coming up with new theories of, of relativity or new ways to interpret it but just you know person to person human to human, when you think about uh, the existence of singularities, uh, do you believe singularities are real? Um, if so, you know, can we 
understand them better through the Event Horizon Telescope. And if not real, um, I'd ask you to speculate on uh, the prospects for quantum gravity to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. So whichever way you choose, it'll lead us down a world line of interesting import uh, to my audience. Yeah. So so let me just say as, as, as a disclaimer, I'm not a theoretical physicist, so I don't usually study. Me neither. Some of my best friends are. Some of my best friends are, though. I know. You can date I, my daughter. I, I let them date my daughter. It's okay. Yeah, and, and, and they make for good cocktail party guests. Um, so, but that being said, uh, black holes are fascinating. I mean, uh, as, as far as we know, a singularity does form at the center of a black hole. Shielded, of course, because of the cosmic uh, the censorship conjecture from our view. Um, and... And this is, of course, some of the best evidence that we have that we don't really know everything. I mean, this is where gravity and quantum mechanics really have to combine at that singularity. So, so what happens in the, inside the event horizon is of great interest to mathematicians and, and physicists and, and, uh, and the mystery of the information paradox. Now, at the, at the level of the event horizon, I tend to think that that's a classical region. Right. So, so for example, the M87 event horizon, you and I, if we were fell through that, we wouldn't even know we had fallen through it. Right. The, the curvature of space time is so low that we would just kind of pass right through it. We wouldn't even know that we were no longer visible to the rest of the universe. Right. So huge, you, know, you don't need quantum mechanics to really understand what happens there. I mean, we're still eating our cheeseburgers or whatever we're doing as we fall through that event horizon. Now for, for a solar mass black hole or a few solar masses, that, that it's much different. There you, spag you spaghettify pretty quickly because the tidal forces are such that your feet are ripped off your body and, and hilarity ensues, as they say. But, <laughs> but uh, so one of the questions that you ask is, can the EHT say something about quantum gravity? Can we learn something about the singularity? And, and there... My first answer is kind of no, that we're in this range where our sensory apparatus that we've built with this Earth-sized telescope can only look at this classical construct that shields the inner complexity of the black hole. But there are some ideas that the quantum mechanical states of the black hole could leak out. They could tunnel across the event horizon, and you might wind up seeing a horizon-scale manifestation of those quantum states. And there, there have been some papers published, and I pay close attention to these papers, where they say, if there are some, you know, elements of the interior of the black hole uh, that uh, line up perfectly, you could wind up with changes in the shadow shape, or changes in the temporal behavior of the shadow. And that would be kind of interesting to look for. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how you know, probable it is that we'll see something like that, but you never say never where black holes right. are concerned, right? And and then there's the other. You you, you didn't you didn't mention this, but uh, but I'll I'll mention it uh, uh, with your permission. Of that we might not be looking at a black hole. I mean, there is the possibility that we're looking at a, you know a black hole mimic, you know, like some kind of a, a gravistar or or some kind of boson star. Now, I, I view these as as highly non-probable. I mean, they're very exotic constructs. I mean, I know how to make a black hole, kind of with matter falling in on itself. I don't know how to make a boson star. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to make some of these other exotic things. And, and there are some people in our collaboration who think about how you could tell the difference hmm. between these. And there's some very interesting work going on there, too. So, so the, oh, the fundamental great. nature of these objects is front and center. Yeah, I mean, I pointed that out when I spoke to, uh, to Reinhard, uh, earlier this year, you know, that the citation the Nobel committee gave, it didn't say for, you know, imaging the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, it said imaging a compact object and using it as a, la a laboratory for testing GR, which mm -hmm. at its core it is, as is M87, whatever you've seen, the preponderance of it, you can never say never, but the preponderance of evidence seems to suggest that it is a black hole. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet, uh, you know, to call it a, a, a compact object is eminently more correct, uh, but it might not be as, as provocative and descriptive. And that's why 
I want to get your thoughts about this uh, information paradox, which we hear a lot about. And every so often, uh, uh, friends of mine like uh, Sabina Hassenfelder, who's been a guest on the show, she's kind of a, a little bit of a snarky, you know, cantankerous uh, scientist, theoretical physicist. And she always, whenever there's a new paper about the black hole information paradox, she goes, oh, it's been solved again. You know, so it's the question, <laughs> the question is it really a paradox? Is it just hype? Uh, she claims it's it's complete hype, and many people do because it relies on sort uh, on something, you know, re- associated with Hawking radiation, which is you know, a- in principle observable, but in practice unobservable, just the time scales and all. Um, and yet, and yet, uh, when I had Lenny Susskind on, he said that the what he calls the stretched horizon, which is I think a one Planck length above the event horizon, is the most interesting aspect, not the singularity. Uh, and so talk about what else we can learn that's surprising um, from, let's talk about the next generation yeah, event horizon. Can that, mm-hmm. can that telescope, will you be able to learn more about, you know, getting ever closer to the event horizon such that perhaps you specifically could, con- not you, your collaboration that you lead could con- comment on the information paradox and help to resolve it from an experimental point of view, rather than just, you know, people like Hawking conceding it, you know, to a, a bet, uh, to mm-hmm. w- win a bet with John Preskill, past guest on the show. <laughs> um, so talk about that. Can the NGVAHT, what is it, and how will it improve our knowledge, potentially or not, of the information loss paradox? Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I like your show. Me so, <laughs> uh, so, um, so the, the first thing is that the, the just briefly the NGEHT is is the next phase of the EHT, and we want to add uh, enough sites around the globe to double the number of dishes that are working, and because the number of baseline pairs then increases as the square of the number of dishes, we get four times as much data. We're increasing our bandwidth for sensitivity. And what we want to do is move from making still images of black holes to movies. And and more than that, we want to uh, increase the frequency of the observations, which then increases our angular resolution. So the sharpness of these images will increase. And and that's important at getting to the potentially the information paradox, because as I mentioned earlier in the show, the shadow is made up of concentric rings. And, And these happen for the following reason. The, m- most of the bright emission you see in this shadow feature is light that's bent around the black hole. It comes directly to us from behind the black hole and is bent around it. But there's an interior ring that we call the N equals one ring for not obvious, but geeky reasons where the light has made a U-turn around the black hole. So it's really sampling now the intense curvature of space time when it goes around. And then that ring is interior to that shadow and it's much thinner. So it encodes in a more detailed way, GR and the space time around the black hole. Now there's an infinite number of these rings that so the N equals two ring is made up of photons that do a full U-turn. They, they want make an orbit around the entire black hole. Hmm. They are now sensing the space time much closer to the event horizon. And you can imagine as you go to N equal four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, that you're getting asymptotically close to the true horizon, the true photon orbit, right? Now, the longer these photons stay in this area, the more probability that, the higher the probability that they could start to either scatter off of some quantum state, or they could sense something that happens on very long time scales. Mm -hmm. So potentially, and we'd have to have, we'd have to build a, a, a next, next, next generation uh, event horizon telescope but if we could parlay this this infinite nest of rings into a sensory apparatus that potentially could be um we could potentially tell us something about the quantum states interiors of the black hole that would be something that could start to tell us something about the information paradox you know or this one plank length uh stretched horizon above the true horizon Mm-hmm. So uh, it's not a, it's not a great answer, but we're always thinking about the next thing, and 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 black holes are so strange, they're so fractal in yeah. the way they bend light that this could just be uh, an inroad into what the interior of the black hole looks like. 
Excellent. Um, so before we turn to the human interest portion of the podcast, I want to ask a couple of more, um, a couple of more questions, uh, the technical bent, uh, this one coming from another audience member who is asking in general about the prospects for multi messenger, um, uh, learnings about black holes, courtesy of EHT and NG EHT plus X, where X could be anything. But I'm going to add Meerkat, which just last week had these incredible images in the radio. Meerkat's a Ooh. precursor to the Square Kilometer Array, which will be the biggest radio telescope of its kind ever ever deployed. Um, not the longest baseline. You guys uh, own, own uh, that distinction, uh, at least until somebody, you know, Elon builds a, a, another space interferometer in space. Uh, but I want to ask you about the prospects for multi-messenger astronomy and what you thought when you saw the meerkat images which are just just stunning to look at and in particular if you do you know release sagittarius a star and i hope that you'll do that you know here first before you go to some aps press conference you'll come on the into the impossible podcast with yours truly and you'll announce it and then later you'll go to stockholm or where we're going to go but anyway answer this question please if Meerkat, uh, if EHT does image Sag A star, could you immediately use some of the data from Meerkat or other high precision uh, measurements in a completely different radio wavelength band? Yeah, yeah, R really, really good. And, and again, another astute question. So first, the multi messenger aspect. And we'll get to Meerkat in, in, in a moment. Um, there are huge potential connections between the EHT and many other facilities. You know, we're we're now. Uh, at the smallest scales where you can study black holes. We're at the event horizon. We're seeing light bending around it. And when you look at these black holes in the X-ray, when you look at them in the infrared, um, even in gamma rays, a lot of the emission we think comes from right near the event horizon. So, so one of the games that we like to play is looking at flaring activity. Because when you're so close to the black hole, it's roiling, it's bubbling, it's boiling. And every once in a while, you'll get a, a magnetic reconnection event, we think, where magnetic fields are so torqued up, they're so twisted, they're so intertwined, that they will then snap, reconnect, and release huge amounts of energy, and we get flares. So if you look at the at Sag A star in the center of our galaxy, you'll see X-ray flares that are 50 times the normal fluence, 50 times the amount of energy normally coming out of them. And if we could catch that, with the EHG, we could tell you what was happening when that flare went off, right? Mm -hmm. You could see it erupt in the image, potentially. And, and that would tell us a huge amount about how black holes accrete, how they uh, deform the space-time around them, how they launch jets. So this is one of the real uh, key questions for modern astronomy, and it relies completely on multi-messenger. You know, we, we need to see it in the X-ray so we understand how all the electrons are emitting across the spectrum. We need to see it evolve spatially. And, and, and that will tell us a, a lot about what's happening very close to the black hole. Mm -hmm. now, now, for Meerkat, the, first of all, those images are astounding. Yeah. I mean, so cool. as they say, you can't make that up. I mean, there are some really crazy structures in the center of our galaxy, exploding supernovae, pulsars zipping off in different directions, something called the mouse, something called the snake. I mean, it's it, you have to think about the animal kingdom just to capture the, the, the richness of what we're seeing. But uh, it, interestingly, the EHT and Meerkat don't actually play too well together because Meerkat is at such a lower frequency. Mm. So, uh, Sag A star, for example, is kind of shrouded by this plasma, and it's only by going to very high frequencies that we can see all the way to the center of the black hole. If Meerkat were to look at Sagittarius A star, it would just see this blob. Mm. And, and so Meerkat is looking on much wider type, uh, size scales. And the EHT, uh, because of its intense resolving power, only can really look at a very small portion of the sky so um they're they're, they're not uh meerkat creates the context in which sagi star exists in which we study it with the ehd but it'd be hard to look at the data simultaneously mm -hmm. between the two the two instruments got it um so we'll come back to maybe some technical things when we finish out our uh, audience question segment i hope you have uh, 15 more minutes shep is that okay 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. So we've presented a story <clears throat> of you as a scientist, but now I want to take a step back and talk about you as a human being and uh, things that, that interest you and things that drive you and allow you to persevere past the many, many challenges, human, technical, uh, political, financial, uh, uh, cultural that you've had to endure, but let me, let's go back really far back. And I've asked this of the, you know, dozen Nobel laureates I've had on the show. And I want to ask you, um, so what, what drew you to what you do now, at, uh, in your youth? Was there something in particular that, that, you know, initiated this love of astronomy and then led to, you know, radio astronomy as your particular subspecialty? Wow. Uh, you know, I, I don't think so. I was not a boy astronomer. You know, I wasn't grinding my own lenses. I wasn't, you know, out in the backyard with a with a telescope, anything like that. I did see an eclipse when I was 13, which made a huge impression on me. Total uh, eclipse of the sun, I um, think it was 1980. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I think I got I caught the bug when I went to Antarctica. Uh, so I, after I graduated college, I graduated pretty early. I was only about 19 when I graduated. And I was kind of burned out. And I saw this note that said, go to Antarctica, you know, like do all this crazy, amazing Low stuff. wages, like, a certain de- chance of death, like the, uh, <laughs> the Shackleton <laughs> advertisement that, that appealed yeah, to you. Yeah. yeah. Nothing like joining the Shackleton expedition. <laughs> uh, there was a stowaway apparently on that. On that <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, but I, I got down there and I really got bitten by the bug of doing science in challenging circumstances. You know, what, what do you do when you're really, you have to be self-reliant. Right? Mm-hmm. If you want to fix something, you have to fix it yourself. There's no radio shack down the road. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I really liked that. And then when I got to MIT for grad school, uh, I, I got co- connected fairly quickly with this VLBI group doing this radio interferometric observing because I like going to different places, making these systems work, bringing all the data back together, making these uh, images of the sky with unparalleled angular resolution. But but like everybody, we all want to discover something new. Like we, 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 doing incremental science is fantastic. I mean, that's the way most science is done. We all get together, we move the ball down the field. But but I think that some of a lot of us are just thinking, God, how can I just do something really out there? And and that was this project, the EHT. You know, we, we I looked at this, and after doing the um, you know, paying my dues, you know, like doing all the, the grunt work to learn radio interferometry and, and doing a lot of observations. I saw this opportunity and I said, no one's really working on this. Like, everyone thinks this is A too hard. It's not the right time. Uh, we'll never get the funding for it. And I, I threw myself into it. And it turns out that when you do that, I think, uh, was it Goethe who said, you know, attempt great things and cosmic forces will come to your aid, th- that kind of thing. Uh, I'm not sure who said that, right. but, but, but it, it really was that kind of thing. We, we got a small group together. We made our first observations with entirely new instrumentation, purpose-built for this experiment, and, and we took risks. And that was the big thing, that we, we took risks. And so if you ask me what got, got me into this, it was uh, the love of instrumentation, but also the just the confidence that we could do something that was really meaningful and interesting and new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something deep and, uh, and undone. Just to say. Yeah, um, so when I think about, uh, you know, people that coming up, obviously there are always, you know, challenges. It sounds like you were burned out at, at a certain point and then this reinvigorated this new intellectual passion for you. Um, for somebody that's struggling with such things themselves, you know, burnout is quite real. Uh, I make the joke sometimes that I, you know, as an astronomer, I spend more time on telecons than telescopes. Um, how do you deal with the burnout, you know, lately with, with, you know, the proliferation of Zoom, you know, is great on one hand, because we can have all these meetings instantaneously, you don't have to travel, get on an airplane, you know, get sick and then bring it back and then, you know, lose time traveling or commuting even. But, um, mm-hmm. but what, what have we lost and, and how do you personally deal with these, you know, the challenges, the burnout, you know, it's a real phenomenon in academia and, uh, and even a lot of my listeners that aren't in academia, this new reality that we're living in with multi-continental collaboration, uh, it's kind of put you in a unique position to comment on it. So how do you deal with it? What's your routine like? Do you have any tips for listeners? 
Yeah. So, well, so first of all, the, the EHT was, has always been a global endeavor. You know, we, we reach across borders. So first of all, the, the EHT was, has always been a global endeavor. You know, we, we reach across borders. We, we tap into expertise wherever we, we find it. We, by the nature of the project, we have to bring telescopes together. So there's, uh, there's this sense that either we do this together or we don't do it at all. So I, I think there's, there's an African proverb I've, I've heard that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So at first we went fast, but then to image the black hole, we had to go together. So there was a, an understanding that this really was a moment for the world to come together in a certain way in, and solve a problem that no one group could do by themselves. So that, that, that was definitely part of it. But you know, we, we do struggle with the collaboration aspect of it. Um, we've always been on Zoom. We've always been on telecons, but now we're 100% on telecons and people are burning out uh, because you need that face-to-face -face contact. One of the ways I describe it to my team is that on Zoom, it's very difficult to be quiet. So when, when I sit in front of a whiteboard with my team uh, and we're all scribbling things on the whiteboard, at some point there's a moment when everybody just stops talking and people are just digesting what they're seeing and they're going through their own internal process and they're trying to think about what comes next. And on Zoom, you don't have that silence. So there, there's a way in which people, when they get together, operate differently than on Zoom. So if people are getting burned out, I hear you. If people think things are not normal, I hear you. Uh, we are muddling along as best we can. And, um, and now I'm thankful that we're able to start meeting in person again. So at, at Harvard, where we have the, the Black Hole Initiative offices, we are coming together and, uh, we're, we're sitting in front of whiteboards and it's working out well, but it's, um, it's a challenge. It really is. The, the EHG result resonated with a lot of people. I mean, we, we, we conservatively estimate that a billion people have seen this image. So it, it, and it was on the front page, which is about every newspaper on the planet. So it, it was a moment when everybody's eyes were fixated on one thing at, at one time. And, and when you combine that with the near instantaneous, Twitter sphere and the near instantaneous social media sphere, you, you create an environment where, where the unintended can happen. The unintended almost must happen. And in, in addition to all the wonderful coverage that we got and, and the wonderful interviews that I gave, that Katie gave, that many people in the collaboration gave, there were things that people grabbed onto uh, that I think were, were a little bit darker. And, you know, Katie is, is an absolutely wonderful researcher, and she played a, 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 a key role in all of the work that we did, um, as well as other junior collaborators. We have early career scientists, really, were the lifeblood of this, of this uh, collaboration. And, and I, I would say that people came to, to her defense. Um, it, was, it was quite unfortunate. Uh, I think that the people who were criticizing uh, the process or who went negative did not understand the 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 way we work as a team, and uh, and and that's really what this was. It was a team effort, and so for for them to pick apart the team was something that was foreign to all of us, and it was uh, unwelcome, and I don't think it was right, and 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 thankfully uh, we all uh, supported Katie, and uh, and she's now gone on to be junior faculty at Caltech and is doing. Absolutely wonderfully, as are many of the uh, early career people in our group. Um, and so I think that in the end, uh, as as my departed mom used to say, living well is the uh, best revenge, maybe, or maybe many people say that. But uh, uh, so just uh, relying on the team and understanding internally what we did uh, was give us a lot of security. So, uh, last uh, couple questions from the audience have to do with um, uh, with aspects of relativity uh, that uh, perhaps may or may not be uh, particularly relevant, but let me ask them. Can you see other sources, compact objects? You said before you can't rule out that this isn't some kind of dark star, boson star, whatever. Um, are there other potential target uh, science opportunities with EHT as it is? Um, for looking at massive uh, objects that may not be black holes? That's very interesting. So, so the EHT is also looking at 
other black holes for which we don't have the angular resolution to see the shadow, mm. but where we can see the jets that are powered by the black holes as they emerge from the center part of the galaxy. And, and understanding how those uh, collimate, how they accelerate, how they transport energy and matter across galactic scales, that's an entirely new and interesting and exciting cottage industry. So, you know, it, it's one of those situations where in our spare time, we also look at these incredibly interesting other sources too. So there's a lot that the EHT can do when it's not looking at the shadows. Um, there are also astronomical masers. So these are sources where you get uh, amplification of light in a certain wave band, just like a laser pointer mm -hmm. that you might use during a presentation, but it happens in space on much larger scales. And some of those molecular transitions occur in the wave band of the EHT. So we may be able to use the EHT to study dying stars or star forming regions where some of these lasers and masers occur in the atmospheres of stars. So a completely different kind of context. So we're, we're looking at this interesting technique and we're finding new applications all the time. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, talk about the, uh, the images of the polarization. One of my favorite topics, what did that add to our understanding of M87 and what future, um, uh, you know, incarnations of the polar metric capabilities of EHT will potentially lead to in or and without uh, NG EHT. Right. So the polarization images were really wonderful because the whole reason that black holes shine in the radio is because of synchrotron radiation. And that's high speed, high energy electrons orbiting magnetic fields. If there are no magnetic fields, you're not seeing any of this radiation. So we knew there were these magnetic fields, but understanding the structure of them also tells you how the black hole is feeding. So there's one mode of feeding in which you have something called a magnetically arrested disk, where the plasma that's funneling towards the black hole pushes the magnetic field so that it becomes stiff and it stops any more accretion from happening. So it's, it's an arrested disk and that has one form of magnetic field around it. Then you have standard and normal evolution, which is more of a, uh, of a, of a torturous kind of, of uh, random magnetic field that operates around the, uh, the black hole. And we're, we're now being able to, we're now telling the difference between these. So we're now looking at, at the M87, realizing that it does seem to operate like a magnetically arrested disk. And so now we understand from these magnetic fields how matter is actually getting funneled through the event horizon. So it's a big advance or an incredible interview, uh, a really wonderfully vulnerable uh, side of you, which uh, will delight uh, my audience, but also very technical, nerdy, and fun, uh, which will delight you know the other half of my audience. Uh, so I, I do want to express my deep gratitude on behalf of myself and my listeners uh, for going into the impossible with yours truly and spending so much of your valuable time on me. I, uh, and I want to wish you the best in your success and, and uh, offer you our deepest gratitude for opening with your colleagues this phenomenal view of the universe. Well, thanks very much, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> <laughs>